Hi, welcome back for more as we start examining the history of art and the representation of power. Uh, in this mini video lecture, we'll talk about the depiction of warriors. We've already uh, met some um, from ancient Mexico, and it's time to pivot elsewhere in the ancient world to take a look at the depiction of uh, power and uh, warrior fierceness um, in the history of art. And of course, that all plays to the overarching message of power and supreme authority. So let's pivot to the PowerPoint and I'll show you a couple more examples. All right, you might remember um, as we were talking about um, the depiction of Egyptian pharaohs, for instance, um, among the many examples I've already discussed when it comes to power, politics, and glory, glorifying a ruler's um, involves the following recipe. Um, they're often idealized. Sometimes there are symbols associated with them, um, perhaps tools that represent their supreme authority, perhaps weapons of conquest and war. And the composition usually is all about them. And um, what we'll see um, in play in today's uh, mini lecture is uh, the implementation of a central focus and hierarchy of scale. So let me show you what I'm talking about. All right. We are in um, present day Nigeria, but back in the day, it was made up um, in part by a um, kingdom called the Benin Kingdom. And it's from these uh, people that this plaque uh, was made. It is a cast uh, brass plaque um, and a great example of a very raised sculptural relief. It's called Plaque with Warrior and Attendants and it was created either in the 17th or early 18th century. It measures about 20 inches in height. They say around the 13th century was the origin of uh, what would become a royal dynasty in Benin. Uh, the king was the center of the universe and literally occupied the center um, of rule from his palace. And in this palace, you would find many of these plaques um, hung. You can see on the very top, there are holes from which to hang these plaques. And they represent many of the kings um, of the dynasties of Benin. And so they provide a living legacy, um, a testament to the ongoing power um, and the generational um, authority of rule in this um, royal kingdom. As you can see through hierarchy of scale, one can see that there is a standout among all of the many figures included on this plaque. And that's emphasized, of course, with that central focus as well. That male figure is armed. He is the king who ruled from a palace as the king palace of the entire kingdom. Since he rarely left the palace, images of him like this communicate his power and strength. He holds a sword and wears a helmet. References to leopards also appear on his apron and uh, shield. And leopards were animals whose fur were also worn by the kings of Benin as a symbol of royal authority. These plaques would be hung in the palace, as I said, and again, this king would join others as a testament to the strength and legacy and power of that dynasty. Not unlike the Tula warrior columns we saw earlier on this content page, these Images, these figures, are facing frontally with serious expressions that communicate solidarity and organized might. 
let's head to Egypt and take a look at a similar depiction of a warrior, a pharaoh, who is represented as a mighty warrior um, in a two-sided work that glorifies war as well. It's called The Palette of King Narmer. It's from the pre-dynastic pre -dynastic period in Egypt from circa 3000 BCE, made up of the uh, stone slate. It's about two feet in height, and it is, as I said, a two-sided uh, shallow sculptural relief, meaning it isn't as raised and pronounced as the plaque we saw in the previous slide. So during its early history, Egypt was divided into two areas. There was an upper Egypt in the south and a lower Egypt in the north where the majority of the fertile land lay. Under King Narmer, the two Egypts were un reunited and that formed the first Egyptian dynasty of some 31 dynasties total. So it seems that this plaque or palette commemorates the unification of the kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt by King Narmer. Though they say it's probably unrealistic to give him all the credit, this is probably something that took decades, maybe even centuries to make happen because it's such a vast area. Like um, we've seen in the previous um, example of a plaque from Benin, the king is depicted larger through hierarchy of scale um, to underscore his importance in the composition. You can see him large here on the left, and then the king appears again on the right, also enlarged through hierarchy of scale. So it's important to do that, of course, to underscore and credit him for the unification of Egypt and also underscore his divine status. There's a hieroglyph as well at the very top of the palette that is an image of a fish, a catfish, and a chisel, hard to see here, that are framed within the lines that represent the columns of the royal palace. So this is his name as a hieroglyph. That's how we know who he is. And of course, that translates to literally mean Narmer. So on the side on the left that we're looking at, he's wearing the bowling pin shaped crown of Upper Egypt. But on the right, so on the back of the palette, he's wearing a different crown style that represents lower Egypt. So the fact that he is sporting both crowns shows that he's the king of both upper and lower Egypt. Typically what you find in Egypt is something called a composite view. That means in their figurative style you have both a frontal presentation, so for instance the torso is facing forward, but the face and legs are inside or profile view. That is part of the ancient world tradition of leaning more into concept over naturalism than embracing a true um, optical realism that would come much later in art history. He's shown on the left about to smite with this mace, an enemy, hit him hard, but uh, and represent, of course, his um, power, um, but also be an overall representation of not just conquering one enemy, but many enemies. The falcon god Horus, who I've mentioned before as well, as we were exploring uh, Egyptian temples, um, is represented here. He is often included adjacent to representations of Egyptian pharaohs as a protector god. He's holding a hieroglyph um, that represents um, the face of a man 
and a papyrus plant, the stalks of the papyrus plant. That's a hieroglyph representing Lower Egypt. You're probably wondering what the cows are doing up here. That's supposed to be the goddess Hathor, whom we've met as well. She's considered the divine mother of the Pharaoh who sustained him with her divine milk. Additional fallen enemies can see down below. On the right hand side, we continue to see um, a repeat of the image of Hathor and King Narmer's name. Then in another scene, you can see the king um, enlarged with his troops and the conquered and decapitated enemy dead laid out in bird's eye view. Speaking of fantastic beats and guardian creatures, you can see um, a mirror image presentation of this some kind of fantastic feline with an elongated neck um, that is interlocking, perhaps symbolizing the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. This recessed space is why this is called a palette. The Egyptians, as you might know, are famous for using eyeliner to line their eyes. And so they think this really might have been an object used for that purpose with some kind of medium filling this like your favorite makeup compact you scored at Sephora. All right, so many images um, glorifying power and showing King Armor to be the penultimate warrior when it comes to bringing glory and unification to ancient Egypt.